manufacturing share of GDP is less than half of the average of all developing countries. So to have the snapshot, next slide please, of what it looks like across the continent. But it's not all doom and doom. We were able to sign the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that goes live in January of 2021. And what does this mean for youth employment opportunities across the continent? A total of 67.9 million people will be lifted out of poverty by the implementation of this agreement, the proper implementation of this agreement. And half of the people lifted from moderate poverty will be from Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, DRC, and Niger. So those countries need to position and take advantage of what um, have been projected. The proportion of workers in the following sectors will increase power, construction, manufacturing, transport, 10.3% wage increase for skilled labor, 9.8% wage in increase for skilled labor. So there's opportunities to be had. A fortune favors the brave, fortune favors the bold. Next slide, please. Next slide. And just the one after that, I'm on slide 11 now.
2.3 trillion naira in naira terms uh, and was announced in June of 2020. So as I said earlier, it has the tax exemption of during the finance tax of 2019 were activated to support SME. The survival fund was announced, uh, 50 billion was later increased, 50 billion payroll support was extended to SME to safeguard 300,000 jobs. Uh, 200 billion support to fund the way for Africans, and those alerts have been received. It's all over right the news, the testimonials. They're actually getting the money. Guaranteed uptake of um, produce for 1.7 million individuals. So, SMEs that produce sanitizers, masks, things like that, guaranteed uptake by the government for those things. There's a sort project, solar home system intervention for 5 million households and with the creation of 250,000 jobs by December, from December 2020. So the preparation has been done, the, the uh, program is kicking off, it's twofold. Electricity is a catalyst for prosperity, uh, for a lot of things, right from education to productivity and onwards. And then the people that will install the system, that will be 250,000 jobs. Mass housing construction is also another way that governments create jobs to stimulate the economy. So building 300,000 housing units with a potential of 1.8 million jobs across the country. So public works programs have been introduced to create 774,000 jobs across all local governments. Now these are projects that are not just giving out numbers, these are projects that have been in the news. I know that it always seems like government doesn't talk enough and I think things really happen, but just do some research, you'll know people that are benefiting from this, that are experiencing this. These projects are actually live and, and ongoing, so they're verifiable and they're ongoing. Extension of deadlines and suspended uh, penalties, that's for the tax filing, and the payment of enhanced hazard allowances for our healthcare workers at the federal level. On so the next slide, on slide 15 now, um, local production of all that we can have, trying to enable production of things like steel fabrication, shoes, ceramics, just to make sure that manufacturing and productivity continues for competitiveness. Um, all sorts of other initiatives, I won't go line by line, but you can have the slide and read them. Basically, jump starting entrepreneurial activity, which is another way to bring down unemployment. If there are no jobs to be given, then jobs have to be created. So 250,000 new business names being registered at a discount is to encourage particularly our younger demographics to start their own businesses. I know that while I taught at the faculty of law, almost all my students, so many of them had a side of the law on real. Either, oh, I do hair, I make t-shirts, or I'm an event planner, or I plan children's birthday parties, something or another. They were all hustling and doing very well. Everywhere I go now, I still bump into them everywhere. They just come to me, oh, I'm going to catering this event. I do not think, oh, I'm in practice during the week, but I want to cater at the weekend. So multiple streams of income is also another thing that Nigerian youth are very good at. So encouraging them to register those business names puts them as a, as a position to be formalized and also, of course, then government is able to get taxes and then the economy is better placed and stronger. So for monetary stimulus, uh, that's slide 16 now. Uh, next slide. Uh, a number of interventions were announced by the CBN, moratoriums of loans, um, so a number of, of stimulus were announced and those are ongoing as well. Now slide 17, formalizing the, the informal sector, which is what I started alluding to. So 14% of Nigeria's GDP is actually MSME, micro, small, and medium enterprise. But of that 48%, I'll say maybe only about 2% are small and medium-sized enterprises. By far, the micro are the underpin of this economy, believe it or not, the tender seller, all across the country are the backbone of this economy. So we have to take care of them. That's why when the global shock, Nigeria's economy just seems to defy gravity because they're not connected to that vulnerable global uh, chain. So it's insulation, but at the same time, we have to help
self-defense skills because they are operating at under capacity. So from the line of it, a form of sector is key, the growing and scaling of our MSMEs is key. And so the administration has also taken that one as a policy step. And that's part of why we have the reduction of business claims, the entire ease of doing business intervention, which I'm privileged to anchor and I'll speak on later on. But that's that's the reason why those are being done. Next slide, please. Again, another way to, to rescue and to to ensure growth is to make sure that we start right from education and skills development. You can see here we're in a center of excellence because just even having the academic knowledge is really not enough when you get out there. They have to be ready, they have to have skills. Whatever degree they have, they have to know how to monetize it. So monetizing knowledge, entrepreneurial training, skills development, multiple streams of income, uh, and of course, making our educational system more robust. The, the government started an entire program for recent graduates, and that, that has been quite successful since there are no jobs. It's at least a stipend, and they go all across the country. So you have entire, they work as uh, agri extension workers, they work as teachers, they work all across in different sectors, and it's been quite a, a good program, initiated by His Excellency the Vice President. Um, industrial development, I'm going to slide my screen now. Industrial development, the Honorable Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment has been hard at work. We have special economic zones coming on board. We have um, just SME clusters with all the, the tools required to make sure that the ITP power stations and where artisans can group, congregate, and work with shared services. So we have that across the country, the smaller clusters and the larger special economic zones in regions across the country. They're upcoming. I think we're having two new ones per year till 2023. So those are some of the initiatives coming up in that regard in industrialization. Next slide, please. For investment in infrastructure, there's quite a few real projects going on. And that's the Minister of Transport and for um, works, the roads, at least one federal road in each state across the country is being worked on. So we have quite a few uh, robust constructions across the country and rail projects across the country also. We all know that infrastructure is a catalyst for growth of the economy and competitiveness is what leads to productivity and creates jobs so that businesses are growing, they employ more people, and then more young people can start their own businesses because the business climate is more conducive and allows them to do so. So investment in Africa's competitiveness advantage, that's slide 22. Then this is the, the trade, the importance of trade, and it represents basically a lifeline. It's something that every African country needs to plug into. Nigeria has been really focused on that, but we need to do more. Um, and that's why, uh, part of why I'm on loan. Um, slide 22, public-private initiatives. In the COVID context, just to a couple of examples, we all heard about the CACOVID, now famous for their warehouses, but CACOVID is a public-private intervention across the country to give palliatives to Nigerians. There is other interventions, um, we have the Tony Edwin Foundation intervention for African entrepreneurs that has been going on for a few years and there, there are several others um, that have been working with Nigerian youth and just with on entrepreneurship.
depending on their economies. Next slide, please. Ease of doing business has a strong correlation with the job creation, and I think I've just given some practical examples of how that is to the case. So, I think um, sectors like agriculture, manufacturing, services are, are delivering a disproportionate amount of jobs or can deliver a disproportionate amount of jobs, much needed jobs across the country. So, we have some priority sectors that we focus on with an eye to lifting 100 million people out of poverty and making sure that Nigeria is a progressively easier place to do business. Next slide, please. This program sits within the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. And the third pillar of that plan speaks to competitiveness. So all the things I've talked about with ASCFTA and just making sure that we have a conducive environment, speaking about competitiveness and productivity of the Nigerian economy, that's the third pillar of uh, the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. And that third pillar is divided into two parts. The first part deals with hard infrastructure, where you have the ministers of transport, ministers of work and housing, the ministers of power, working on hard infrastructure, airports, seaports, um, rail projects, road projects, um, waterways, deep sea ports. A lot going on. There's the new deep sea port coming up at the Lekki Axis. Um, so the presidential and making business environment. Next slide. Council. The PEBEC, which I'm secretary to, was established in 2016. And the mandate was twofold to work on the actual bureaucracy and then to work on the perception of bureaucracy. So that was the twofold mandate that we were given by Mr. President. The council is chaired by His Excellency the Vice President, one of your very own. And so we've been meeting um, since 2016 to see how Nigeria can simplify, remove bottlenecks. And I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what we've been able to do so far and how we hope that this will continue to release more productivity and competitiveness and jobs and employment for Nigeria. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so this slide just gives the membership of the council. So it's just by the president. It has 13 ministers on. So all the key ministers that work on infrastructure and other projects are also members. The Attorney General is a member. The Governor of CPN, the Head of Service, so it has a lot of people issues. She's a member. We have high level representation from the National Assembly and from the judiciary and of course from the private sector. So it's quite a robust council, about 20 members now, and um, report quarterly to the Federal Executive Council, so like an entire government initiative. So the project office that delivers the reforms works with ministries, departments and agencies, state governments, um, all under levels of government. We've just started working with the local government as well in Abuja. Next slide, please. So the business climate, everybody, like the World Bank, everybody has talked about exactly the correlation between the business climate. A lot of meetings and negotiations with civil servants, with private sector, a lot of stakeholder engagement, focus groups, to talk about identified processes. So for instance, with immigration, you can talk about if there's an issue with passport for clear supply, or if we need a visa on arrival, or whatever we want to layer um, technology on to make the processes easier. We focus on reducing the cost of doing business, making things faster, and then making sure there's more transparency. And we do that by focusing on people issues, all the red picking opportunities or corruption. My boss says I'm, I'm too nice about it. I keep this uh, euphemism of red picking opportunities. Um, but yeah, rent picking opportunities and then we work on processes. So sometimes the processes are just too long and unnecessarily so. So we start looking at how these processes can be truncated and we have to agree with the, with the public and civil servants and then of course the infrastructure which is passed on to the honorable ministers. Next slide please. So since 2016 we've had, we normally have an iteration of a national 60 day accelerator in Q1 of every year. So the sixth one will come up in Q1 of 2021 because we had two the first time um, in 2017. So you see that uh, 60 NAP 
were known as Sassy. It shouldn't take us 30 years to reenact. So we started with the finance bill, going through the budget. Last year, we did the finance bill, 2019, with some of business provisions in there. It went. This year, we're working on the finance bill, 2020, that's just going to the National Assembly. So there's going to be continuous reiteration of legislative reform, and that was one of the big, big wins that we were able to deliver. So back to the situation talk. Next slide, please. So the situation talk, next slide. Yeah, so the situation talk, those are some of the over 2 million impressions. It was a nice event, evening event. We made sure that we had the same standard across the country. Uh, the governor stood by the time we had 500 young entrepreneurs in a room ready to ask me questions. Every governor just put aside their speech and just spoke from the heart. Because these are people that voted for you or are going to vote for you. And they're there asking you questions. We don't have roads, we don't have water, we don't have, that it's impossible to get a, a land permit, electricity, whatever it is. Very open conversation, those went well. Um, next slide, please. So we have the omnibus bill. This is the current legislative reform that we're working on at the TEDx. And omnibus bill, this is the first, although I would argue that the finance bill is sort of an omnibus bill because it has different amendments in it. But an omnibus bill is a legislative reform tool where you just sweep your business timing and you pick all the relics or things you want to change and put them in one bucket and pass it through. It's a quick catalyst intervention. So the Omnibus Bill on Business Participation, we had started it in 2018 with the Bar Association, Section of Business Law, and NESG. But we put it on hold to face the camera. So we started it again, and, and, and I was very, very proud. I felt so supported. You should have seen the submission of Faculty of Law University of Lagos. It was robust. It was deep. I mean, I owned this, the dean and my colleagues were huge I was so proud and happy. Uh, and, and it was very, very good contribution. So that's being reviewed right now. We just had a stakeholder engagement, and so we can look forward to more reforms. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the finance bill 2020. We have things in there as well. Next slide. So the PEVEC continues to work on a broad range. It's a bit difficult to put it into, into the shop, but we continue to work on legislative reforms. We continue to work on judicial reforms. We work with state governments to institute smooth claims court in Edo, Ogun, Lagos, Kano, a lot of other states upcoming. We work with state governments across the country since 2016. We've been in, in um, states in regions. We go by geographical zones. At least once a quarter, we're in the region, having uh, regional stakeholder engagement, and the situation being the last one of that. Very successful. The Nigeria has been moving in 2018. We moved very successfully in the, the World Bank study, a Nigerian ease of doing business subnational uh, survey, and it was the best we've ever had. So we were very proud of that as well. We continue to work on regulatory challenges because we had a lot of feedback from private sector on regulatory difficulties in the business climate space. So that's probably the priority at the federal level, working with different regulators to make sure that they're delivering on their service level agreements, to make sure that they're delivering uh, punctually. And please do report them or comment them. I always like to say both. When things are not going right, please report them. Report Dr. NG, <laughs> use the, the app, just download it, have it with you. Whatever it is, police, customs, immigration, CAC, um, they're all there, and please comment them, because they also work very hard. Change is not easy. So when you see things that are good, please comment them also. We continue to work with private sector to get the idea that to get the, the priorities, because it's the private sector where the shoe changes, and the more we solve for private sector, the more they're able to expand and create more jobs and uh, more opportunities. The easier the business climate is, the bolder people will leave, pay their employment, and start up their own businesses and become employers of labor on their own. And then, as I said earlier, the EFTFTA remains a potential 
it has huge opportunity for the Nigerian market to thrive. Um, next slide, please. I'll just say, uh, I mean, I have a whole bunch of recommendations. In conclusion, I would say that basically for African economies in the COVID-19 year, with all the fiscal pressures, the, with the financial pressures that governments are facing, um, I see the opportunity. I see uh, the silver lining in the cloud. I see the lessons that we've been able to learn. We've seen and are taking seriously the state of our healthcare. We've seen and are taking seriously the state of the, the, the signal that our, our resting youth have given us. These are, these are opportunities to make real change. Uh, and good thing that a lot of the plans are already in progress, but these are catalysts to make real change across the continent. So 2020 has been eventful for the world and for Africa also, but despite the gloomy, next slide please. Yeah. But despite the gloomy predictions, Africa was able to handle or is handling COVID. We shouldn't relax. Uh, we can see the second wave happening in other countries. Even here at school schools open a bit of a spike, we shouldn't relax. But we're handling it uh, with relatively low deaths and, and relatively low cases. Uh, so it's something to be proud of and it's something to understand why. I think that Nigerians don't like to die. So we get very uh, serious when it comes to public health. The Ebola one was unreal. I, I remember watching Sky News and I'll never forget this. This reporter said Nigeria has demonstrated to the world that the Ebola virus can be handled. And I was so proud because really, if you recall then, Ebola was something really, really scary. And Lagos State uh, governments in particular, and the federal government at large, really moved decisively, decisively. Uh, Dr. Amir Adadebo, one of our own alumni, alumnus of, of uh, University of Lagos, Luke, was really the hero of Nigeria. So I think that our professionals have continued to demonstrate when you see the NCCC leading in, in public health and uh, infectious disease response, they're doing quite well, so we support them and listen to them. So the opportunity <laughs> from ASPSPA is also there. It's an opportunity to invest in our people, to invest in our youth, to develop our economy by taking seriously all the reforms I already spoke about earlier, I won't repeat them, to develop robust PPP framework so governments can't do this alone. Nigeria's uh, government expenditure is about 10%, federal government's about 10% of Nigeria's GDP. If you ask it, it's still under 20%. That means we need the private sector to be able to deliver that capacity push for the country. We need to, of course, radically reform government spend in line with our new normal with commodity prices. That reform work has been ongoing at the federal government level and really asking states as well. And even in the private sector, there's just no room for waste. And please, 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 please pay your taxes. I know you do because you're paying anyway. <laughs> yes, but I like to tell private sector. But I think I should stop here because I know there's still time for Q&A and I don't even know how much I'm doing for, for time. But I'll just end with slide 49. Next slide. And, and what that just speaks to is that we're on a journey of continuous improvement. We need to institutionalize the reforms and the change. It's a collaborative ex exercise. So it's not government versus the people. It's we're all in it together because of one economy. Federal state, local government, um, national assembly, judiciary, private sector, we're all in it together. Academia, civil society, our thought leaders, we're all in this together. So continuous improvement, collaboration, and institutionalizing. With that, I'll say thank you very much for your kind attention.
are a few questions. But distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to crave your indulgence. At this 4 a.m. in the morning, it has been on in the last 30 minutes. So I'm craving your indulgence and please let's have him speak to us now and then we we'll go back to the question and answer. So, Professor Tony Maletti of Carlton University of Tower, Canada, we're ready for you, sir. And we'll be speaking on enhancing the youth entrepreneurial skills with the opportunities presented by technology, innovation, data science, AI, and social media. Thank you. 
Bible says that he does not think he that he has me. He says somewhere 